you're not as fat as the internet says. And I was like, huh? Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, there's a Reddit thread about like an over under on when you die. And mm-hmm. and by the way, that death thing is very real. I get emotional thinking about this. Mm-hmm. Maybe just a couple times if people, when I'm gone, mm-hmm. people just go like, and it'd be so much cooler if Bird was here. Mm-hmm. Like, God, we'd have so much fun. Like, mm-hmm. wouldn't it be great if Bert was here and he just walked in with a bottle of champagne and and a crazy story or mm-hmm. like I just like. Just when we thought we were out, he pulled us back in. Bert's appearance on Ed Milet's podcast this week was truly extraordinary. There really never has been another comedian as delusional as Bert and the people he surrounds himself with. And if you think I'm hyping this up, just take a look at this. Difficult. Love doing stuff I don't like to do. I think that would surprise people about you because you ha- you are like a disciplined guy. You do have these routines that you do. You are kind of into personal development and self-help, yet there's the machine side of you yeah. that everybody sees like, this dude's out of control. This dude's a big drinker, big partier, a lot of dabbles in everything and so this is why you're so fascinating to me because you're you're this multi-dimensional human and and when people watch you no i'm being serious i think when people watch you it's it can seem on the surface shirts off hilarious as hell filling up arenas all over the place now there's a one-dimensional dude i got it there's a shtick there then you listen to your comedy it's not shtick you listen to your routine and your life and how you actually got here and there's a depth and dimension to you that I think would surprise most people, including the fact that you're really a routine dude. You swim almost every single morning, right? Yeah, I work out every morning. I have a trainer who comes to my house. I, I watch what I eat. I'm pretty strict on my diet. You look great, by the way. Oh, right thank now. you very much. I'm down 40 pounds. Um, okay, whoa, hang on a second. Let's back up that truck. Did it just lay out how multi dimensional Bert Kreischer is? Bert's about as multi dimensional as Tom Segura's side chick, Lauren Compton. <laughs> But that was only the start of it. See, this is the problem. Ed thought he was hyping up Bert, warming up his audience for this once-in-a-generation talent, and he completely forgot that Bert inevitably turns every discussion he's involved in into a therapy session. And it didn't take long for him to show his emotions and start crying. It wasn't his love for family or his friends that triggered him. Oh no, we're talking about Bert here. It was his love for himself that got him in the end. Do you know what a blessing it is that you have what you have? I kind of do. That sounds really crazy, but I yeah. kind of, I have in the moment on stage thought, this is really cool. Uh, you get to take people out of their memory, out of their yeah. out of their thoughts for a second, and you get to get them to be present and laugh. And if and I, I've said this before, if, if I can leave anything, I would my my legacy. I would love for it. Uh, I'll get emotional. I get emotional thinking about this. Maybe just a couple times if people, when I'm gone, people just go like, man, it'd be so much cooler if Bert was here. Like, God, we'd have so much fun. Like, wouldn't it be great if Bert was here and he just walked in with a bottle of champagne and, and a crazy story or like, I just like, I mean, I don't need to cure anything, but like, just for people to go like, God, man, I wish he was here. That was, that would be so fun. Mm -hmm. Like just, and I don't need it to be the world. Just like, like a solid hundred people (laughs) to just be like, man, can you imagine if Bert was here? Mm -hmm. Like that, that energy, I think it's what it, it, that energy is what defines me. It's what I've always wanted and searched for as a kid is, is. I, I wanted, I wanted people like miss me, and like I noticed that like at a certain point, like if I left the room, no one cared, and if I wasn't there, no one was like, "Where's Bert?" I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm just building to hopefully get it to the place where people go like, "God, man," You're like yeah, I wouldn't it be cool. If Bert was here, I, I know my daughters will say that, but oh. that's it. It's just like on a Sunday morning when when yeah. someone opens a bottle of champagne and mm-hmm. goes like, mm-hmm. Bert would have brought a joint. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, you have said three or four things today, like in the history of the show, or like my favorite things ever said. 
Oh, and the reason there's a bunch of people crying with you, the one, they want that too. And some people are sitting there going, I wonder if anybody would miss me. Okay. Who's seriously crying with Bert? Like apart from crying with laughter, but we've heard this before from him, right? He thinks about whether people will miss him. And honestly, I just cannot relate to that. I stopped and thought about it for a while, you know, trying to put myself in his shoes. And even just as a grown man myself, the problem is I really just don't care if people miss me or not when I die. Maybe if he said, I get emotional thinking about all my family and friends when I pass away, hoping they'll be okay and that I did everything I could to be a good father, husband, and friend, but he's more worried about people missing him on a Sunday morning when they pop open champagne? Who drinks champagne on a Sunday morning? Now look, we all know Bert's had issues with drinking, and for my regulars, we've been keeping track of his weight loss transformation, those few months last year where he stopped drinking, started exercising, and improved his diet, not to mention openly doing TRT, but anyway, up until now, I've heard him talk about how the catalyst for those changes were his daughters and his sister, but he opened up a little bit more in this interview about some of the other people who influenced his decision to get healthy, so take a look at this extended clip and I'll pick it up straight after. By the way, did you guys know that Bert had a stalker? If I asked you this question, because I think a lot of people hear feedback as criticism. So when even Ooh, that's a powerful statement yeah do because you, how do you yeah. hear it when you hear that from people you've got this number you got a movie that killed it you got your your this dude fills up anywhere he wants right now and he can do it multiple days bert does you're making a ton of money podcaster crushing you know your your life is really really good right now there's probably a party that's like hey if this is you know do you know who you're dealing with here like i'm pretty functional so do you hear <laughs> feedback even from dudes who love you as criticism because most people that's how they hear it yeah yeah, and what stinks is that when I was at my my lowest, and my lowest was these past probably seven months, starting in January, I did a European tour, then I did an arena tour in the States, and then I promoted the special. I then went to an Australian tour uh, in arenas, and then I did uh, another arena tour, promoted my movie. I did my fully loaded tour, which was six weeks, I think, this year. Then did the cruise and built the cruise was right before that, but I was at my lowest and, and everyone noticed. And I will say that I got emails from, I got texts from everyone. Mm. One of them was Tom's agent. I just apologized to him the other night. He texted me, I'm worried about you, whatever this and that. And I was like, whatever. Ran into him at dinner in New York with Tom. And I said to him, Hey man, you're not my boy. You're not my wife. Go f yourself. If you, mm. if you want to be in my life, sit down and have a drink with me, but I don't even want to hear a word out of your mouth you don't spend time with me you don't know what my life's like i don't want to hear a word i said that to steve byrne i said that to tom i said that to joe i said that to, i said that to everybody because at the time what i was like it it when someone's concerned about you it, you don't hear it that way you don't hear mm -hmm. you you hear them saying i'm better than you in some way or, or mm -hmm. I, I got it together you need to get your together. i don't know what you hear but i did not hear it well mm -hmm. and uh and it wasn't until I realized, oh, they're just, oh, it was my daughters who said they were worried about me. Mm -hmm. My daughters, when they went on tour with us, were fully loaded. We, we had, it was extremely stressful. I had a, uh, a stalker trying to kill me. It was like really bad. Serious? Yeah, it was really bad. And, 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 all, and, and by the way, I got, all this is just, it's bubbling over. It really is. And, and, uh, and my, both my daughters at the end of fully loaded, and granted fully loaded is with the, 32 best comics in the world. Every week it's a new 10 comics. It's my best friends, my, the funniest people in the world. And we're cracking beers at, the, at, at this at breakfast. We're eating mushrooms. We're drinking at the show. We get on a tour bus. We party at night. It, it's f***ing fun as f***ing mm -hmm. I'm 275, but I'm not 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. So like, and I'm benching 225 10 times. I'm strong as shit. I feel good. I don't feel like shit. I feel like shit probably, if we're going to be very honest. And my daughters both said, like, mm -hmm. like at the Gorge, I killed, like, four beers at the end of the show. Last show, I killed four beers, and one of them was an IPA. Mm -hmm. And I snapped. I was like, who the f*** gave me an IPA, like, to oh. kill? It was my daughter, Georgia. <laughs> oh, God. She goes, sorry, I don't drink. I don't know what a Bud Light looks like. Bless her heart. Yeah. And then, and, uh, and we're all sitting, and we got home, and Isla said, you're, you're drinking a lot. Mm. And I was like, really? And, and my sister's like, you look like I want to put a needle in you and just watch you deflate. You look 
bad. Mm-hmm. Georgia said you're red all the time. Like your face is just red. Now my face is normally red because I'm horrible. I was out in the sun in Florida as a kid, but mm-hmm. and that's when I kind of took, like I assessed where I was, and I was like, I was never meant to be 275. Mm-hmm. I was never meant. Dr- drinking now is to getting me getting me through the day. And it's and it, and I say that I wasn't like an early morning I need drinks kind of guy, mm-hmm. but it was just always there. And we'd play, go to play golf, and we'd be like, ah, f- it. Mm-hmm. Let's have let's have a let's just do a double Tito's and soda just to start. Th- and everyone's fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, and when my daughters, and my wife said it, I was like, all right. And then I was just like, I'll do a cleanse, drop fifteen pounds, start all over. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, I was I went to my cardiologist, and I was I was trained for it. I like. Didn't yeah. drink, took a Xanax going in, get my blood pressure down. My cardiologist is like, yo, what's going on? <laughs> He's like, you're the fattest you've ever been, and your blood pressure is 120 <laughs> of, over. I don't right. believe this. Right. And uh, and that's when I think I started, I started this journey of like going, if I want to continue my lifestyle, which I do, then I need to be in control of my lifestyle. Just quietly, I think the best way to differentiate Bud Light from other beers is they usually say Bud Light in big writing on the can. Just saying, hot tip for you. Now, like I said, we've heard most of that before. His wife, kids, and sister became concerned for him, but that was the first time I'd heard him say Tom and Rogan were calling him out as well. I didn't know that. And I think that's interesting because I'm sure most of you thought this as well, that Bert's friends are all enablers. Rogan's called him out a couple of times on JRE, but never anything like what he just said there, especially the part where he apparently snapped back at them and told them to mind their own business. I'll tell you what, when you combine that new revelation with him crying over people missing him when he passes on, yeah, that's full-blown narcissism. Why is Ed trying to sell Bert as some sort of role model to his audience? But I will say this. There was one point in this interview where Ed low-key called out Bert's BS, and I thought this was actually really intelligent, if I'm being honest. So I want to give Ed some credit here. I get that he's running a popular podcast, and it's all about empowerment and positivity and all of that. He's obviously going to find it hard to get good guests on if he's just roasting them all the time, right? Probably why I can never get anybody to come onto this channel. Anyway, but you can even see on Ed's face and through his mannerisms the point at which he's like, okay, hang on, hold up, let's explore this for a moment. And it all started when Bert mentioned people on Reddit speculating about how long he'll last before kicking the bucket. I was in in Austin, and I ran into a guy who was like, you're not as fat as the internet says. And I was like, huh? Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, there's a Reddit thread about like an over-under on when you die. And mm-hmm. and by the way, that death thing is very real. Mm-hmm. It, you don't, It's not going to show up. There's not going to be like huge things that show up before you die. That's right. Just one day. You have a heart attack. Yep. One day you are pushing it too hard. Yep. And and you have a fear of that. Oh, Stay not as that. much not drinking. Okay, not as much not drinking. So w- w- the decision for you long term is just going to be this: Can you mod- moderate it and can you regulate it? And that's what you're going to have to decide. Wow, did you catch that? Bert's more afraid of not drinking than he is of dying. Just let that sink in for a moment. But here's where Ed drops a truth bomb on Bert that caught him off guard. Now, I don't know a lot about Ed, but from what I understand, he had a father with some drinking issues, so he tried to offer Bert some first-hand wisdom, which I actually thought was spot on, and true to form, Bert brushed it off and tried to change the subject. Both your girls know you love them and believe in them. Uh, Both my daughters are hyper aware I love them more than anything in the world, and I believe in them 100%. I'll tell you something to remember. For what it's worth, the number one thing that my dad did that was negative with his drinking, I'm going to tell you what it was. It was not that he would misbehave when we'd go out in restaurants or that he was a jerk or that he, you know, got aggressive. The insidious thing that my dad's drinking did is I worried about him. Uh, Well. And, and, and that's the thing, bro. It's like I created internal stress and I created, and he created in me, my dad created in me. This dude who sits here today who has hundreds of millions of dollars, popular show, great friends, blah, 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 and I chronically worry and have anxiety. And the reason I have, I think I have chronic worry and anxiety is I'm familiar with it. Yeah. And we move towards what we're most familiar with in our life. And when I was a little boy, because, and I loved my dad, I didn't want my, I would worry he was going to leave, I was worried to get killed, I was worried he was going to die, I worried he was going to get in a car accident, I was worried he was going to get in a fight, you know. And he wired into me 
to be a warrior. And it's a repetitive thing I've done. And that's the one thing that you should always govern and watch with your with your girls is that do they worry about their dad? They yeah. love him. They're proud of him. He's an amazing provider. You on the road a billion nights a year and all the things you've had to do in the travel show and all the stuff to get where you are, they're blessed. But you don't want to wire into them this repetitive thought of, I worry about my dad. I stress about my dad. That was the number one thing now that I'm an older man. I've, I had anger issues because I watched my dad be angry. My dad raised his voice a lot in the house. I've had a little bit of that too. That was how you parented back then. Right, exactly. And we respected it. But the big thing was, man, I worry a lot. And I, where's this come from in me? Where's this come from? I know where it comes from. I worried about my dad. That's deep, man. I really like that. It's an interesting perspective you don't really hear about. And look, I'm not suggesting for one second that Bert doesn't love his family or anything like that. There is no doubt in my mind that he wants to be a good father and provider and all of that stuff. But the bottom line is that drinking and partying is more important to him. I mean, he said it himself. He's more scared of not drinking than he is of dying. Live your life to the fullest, I guess. But even in the face of Ed's advice about not letting your kids stress out over your well-being because it will stay with them for life, Bert just tried to change the subject and talk about how parenting used to be different. So then Bert's public therapy session eventually turned to the whole idea of imposter syndrome. Oh man, this was great. Bert puts the imposter in imposter syndrome. Is there a part of you because you're so humble? Do you have, I have, like <clears throat> massive imposter syndrome? Oh, and if you don't have an imposter syndrome, you're an imposter. Like mm. if you're, it, imposter syndrome's real. It's authentic. When we first bought our, when we bought our big house, like the one we're in now, yeah. I was so terrified to post any video on social media because I didn't want anyone to think I had money. I didn't want to lose the, mm. the who I was mm. and like show my backyard. I have a mm. beautiful backyard mm. and I, I will say this i worked very hard to earn that backyard sure. i got very lucky to marry a wife who can recognize good properties but i was terrified to show that mm. and i i hardcore consistently live with this imposter syndrome yep the imposter syndrome was big on this one but just wait until you hear the next question ed asks bert to pinpoint exactly what it is that made him so successful what is it? Like, what's don't don't be humble. Like, what's the thing with you? Is it that you like connect with everyday people? Like, is it like I know you're funny, right? But like, is it like, hey man, I'm rooting for that dude because I see me in him? Mm. What is the thing about you? Is it the work ethic? Is it what is it that's made you in that seat right now? We beat you because we're friends with Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> so the story of our careers. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have to try out for a team. Uh, we got picked. <laughs> Our dad owns League. <laughs> we didn't do anything during this. Oh, sorry, guys. That was my fault. I must have mixed up the clips by accident. My bad. Here's the actual response. I'm sure there's a lot of aspects of this, but I'll tell you the one thing I know that I don't have that I have that not a lot of my peer groups have is I don't mind failing. Ah, that's the one. The story of Bert's life failing upwards. But Ed presses him for more. He really wants to get inside Bert's head for his listeners to understand the true genius behind Bert's success. Let's see what else he could get out of him. Let me ask you one last question on it. And I mean that, like take care of yourself. You're you're way more of an important dude in people's lives than you realize because you have a you have a lot of confidence. And I know that there's probably this side of you that people are like, hey, man, don't get too big. But there's this other part of you, bro. You have such deep humility. I love people that have both of those things. They're super confident, but they got a lot of humility. If someone was listening to this, they're like, hey, man, you chased your dream. Like, you had no idea. You're just a dude in college. And by the way, everybody, I want to re reinforce this. If you have not seen The Machine on Netflix, you have to go see this movie. It's it's a ride. And it's one of those movies, like, you don't really want it to end. It's the Every minute of it is entertaining. Oh, every you. single minute of this movie is entertaining. It's funny, but it's like, it's a real story. I'm sure it's, you know, jived up a little bit. It's so good. And all of his Netflix specials, Razzle Daddle is out, is out right now, but like all of them are awesome. Go check his stuff out. But let me ask you this last. If someone was listening to this, they're like, hey man, I would like to pursue my dream too, but I have a lot of anxiety. I got a lot of worry. I got a lot of imposter syndrome. I got all this stuff that you've described that you still have and you made it anyway. What advice would you give to somebody who's like sitting there going, whatever it is, they want to open up a bakery, whatever it is, right? They want to start painting. What would you say to them? We beat you because we're friends with Joe Rogan. <laughs>
<laughs> so the story of our careers. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, again? I must have some lines crossed or something. Hang on a second. I'll see if I can find the right clip. First of all, the procrastination is the best part. Mm-hmm. Like, just don't don't worry about the time you've spent procrastinating. That's all the buildup stuff. Those are the muscles you're getting to get you to where you need to be. Because I procrastinated just like you did. I'd had great ideas and didn't know where to pitch them and didn't know what to do with them. And then, and then one day you're, one day you're going to stop giving a what everyone else says. But you got to let that happen for you. You got to let yourself say, I'm not going to tell my friends this idea. Uh, They're just going to shit on it. And you just, you just got to say F- it. You really got to say F- it and go, I'm going to try it. I don't want, I don't care if they make fun of me. That's part of the process also. Let them make fun of me. Half the making fun of me is going to get put me in the right direction anyway. But you got to say F- it. You got to go after it. You, you, I think sometimes had I never got on stage or had I never answered that phone Rolling Stone magazine called, had I never taken the balls. To, it's the same thing about getting in the God polar plunge. Yep. That energy is real. You do not want to do it. You're standing on the edge of the pool. All those moments on the edge of the pool are just as valuable as the moments in the pool. Respect the edge of the pool as much as you do inside the pool and let yourself sit with it. Be scared. Do not want to do it. Lay in your bed, roll around. I don't want to go in. This is it. I'm putting all my eggs in this basket. And then once you jump in, go all the way deep, get, get your head under. Don't just put your toe in it Mm. go all the way deep and charge it you get one shot at this life and if you leave anything on the table it's just left on the table (laughs) it's it's you don't you don't get to take it with you sorry just a second guys i'm making some notes here don't be afraid to procrastinate heaps and then when you're ready to dive into the pool go all the way deep Make sure you put all your eggs in one basket. Okay, all right. Okay, got it. (laughs) Now, come on, guys. Really, we all know the story. Bert owes almost everything to Tom Segura and, of course, Joe Rogan. He's even admitted that being friends with Rogan carried his career. I just can't seem to find the clip right now where he said that. But remember the phone call that started all of this? Rogan called Bert and he was on a motorbike in Vietnam filming his travel show. And Rogan told him he had to stop that and do stand-up comedy full-time. Then he got him on his podcast and made him tell the machine story, and then he told him he should tell the story at every opportunity he gets. Yeah, thanks, Joe. How's that going? You're a real stand-up guy. Anyway, guys, no investigative journalisms today, just some old-fashioned podcast cringe. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below, and if you haven't subscribed yet, consider jumping on board so you get all my uploads right there in your feed. That's it from me. I'll catch you in the next one. What the hell just happened today? Like, oh, like no. you, become, you become like a philosopher of all good things.